Right. Hello, welcome to the Middle East 101 lecture series. My name is Serkan Yolachan. I'm a research fellow at the Middle East Institute. And I will be talking to you uh, today on the rise and fall of Neo-Ottoman Turkey. The timing is quite uncanny. I think if you follow the news, you have been hearing quite a bit about Turkey lately. Um, this is because of the Turkish incursion into Syria. If you follow those news, then you've probably heard something about the problematic relationship Turkey has with the Kurds, Kurds both in Turkey, because Kurds are the biggest minority in Turkey, but also Kurds elsewhere, especially in uh, Syria, but also in Iraq. Again, if you follow the news, then you've heard, you know or you've heard something about the ups and downs in Turkey-US uh, relations. Turkey, since the Cold War, Turkey uh, has been a very strong ally of the US and uh, is a full member of the NATO. But the two countries have been experiencing uh, uh, some divergence on a number of issues, uh, one of which is what is called Turkey's turn to Russia. Uh, Turkey has recently bought uh, missiles uh, from Russia on the grounds that uh, the US rejected uh, Turkey's demand for, for similar uh, missiles. And uh, it's not only that, there's also the case of uh, this Turkish Muslim preacher named Fethullah Gülen uh, living in the US uh, in self-exile. Uh, he has followers all around the world, and he's accused by the Turkish government of having plotted the um, coup attempt against Recep Tayyip Erdogan in July 2016. There are uh, some other issues as well, but these, were, these are the main issues on which the two countries uh, have, be, have been diverging. So there has been quite a bit of uh, drama in and around Turkey. And at the center of it all is Mr. Erdogan. Turkey's uh, president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, has been ruling the country since 2003. Um, unlike now, at the time, he, despite having roots in the Islamist movement uh, in Turkey, enjoyed a very good reputation in the West. He was hailed as a Muslim reformer who was actually expected to open up uh, the country, push the military's role, uh, sort of pushed the military out of Turkish politics because until then, Turkey had experienced a number of coup, coups um, almost one every decade since 1960. And so one of the items on his agenda was to democratize Turkish politics. And uh, he was actually able to deliver on these uh, promises. Uh, military actually went back to the barracks uh, it, was, it took a couple of years, but uh, by the 2010, uh, there was uh, no more talk of uh, Turkish military, this possible uh, role, uh, increasing role in, 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 in Turkish politics. Um, and this was, this was a bit surprising because Turkey, despite having pushed the military out of, Turkey, uh, out of national politics, have remained a friend to the West. This was surprising because in almost every other Muslim country where you have a small secular elite with a lot of economic and, and military power, any Islamist opposition or any toppling of that secular uh, minority government by the Muslim majority would mean an anti-Western direction for that country. Uh, one only need to look at countries like Iran and Egypt, um, where such dynamic uh, can, uh, can be seen very clearly. But in the Turkish case, this didn't happen. So it was a Muslim government. It was an Islamic leader uh, for many who was uh, sidelining the, the, the secular establishment, the minority uh, elite in the country but yet still remaining a friend to the West. So this was, in a way, a mirac miraculous story, and uh, Erdogan became the face of this, of this uh, uh, unique uh, story. So in the West, 
He was enjoying a good reputation. Um, the Western countries hailed him as, as a Muslim reformer, uh, opening up the country. With him opening the country, of course, meant that um, social groups that had been marginalized until then, be them Islamists, the Kurds, or the leftists, would now find some new space to come in and have a say in the country's future. At the same time, he enjoyed a very good reputation in the East, in the Muslim East in particular, because what the Muslims saw in Erdogan was a national leader who was bringing Islamic sensibilities and discourses into the center of Turkish politics, while at the same time remaining a good friend to the West, so having very good working relations uh, with, with, with the West, and running a country that was showing incredible economic growth. Those years were marked by um, 8, 9, 10% economic growth every year. So I'm talking about the period between 2003, 2011 or so. And with this sort of global reputation, Erdogan was incredibly emboldened. He had this new confidence to tackle long-term uh, problems of Turkey, one of which was the Kurdish question. So he could, with this sort of mandate uh, from a Muslim majority in the country, but also the support of the global community, he could then go on and be uh, very aggressive in, in maybe solving uh, these entrenched problems like the Kurdish question. And the peace process started uh, some 10 years ago or so. He was also emboldened abroad. He could uh, establish very good relations with a number of countries. He could speak up on uh, issues related to um, Muslim public opinion, let's say, be it Palestine uh, or uh, issues in the Balkans or the Caucasus. And he also used, he, do, he did all of this by using uh, mostly soft power. So he didn't have to use any military power. He didn't have to go coerce countries into acting in a particular way. Everything was happening very naturally, so to speak. And this was a, a process that was then uh, dubbed neo-Ottomanism. So it's, it's a term that is not embraced by the Turkish government itself, but... Uh, but the international community saw this process as Turkey's uh, neo-Ottomanism, the rise of a neo-Ottoman uh, Turkey. But what happened within less than five years or so, um, Turkey went almost to the opposite of the image that we had of it uh, in 2010. Um, but before I... I maybe go into that. Um, I want to show you how um, that, that process was understood internationally. Uh, I want to read out the uh, Time magazine's cover. Turkey's pro-Islamic leader has built his secular, democratic, Western-friendly nation into a regional powerhouse. But can his example save the Arab Spring? Because at the time that the Arab revolutions were sort of sh sh shaking up uh, the Middle East from uh, Tunisia all the way to uh, Egypt and Syria, uh, Erdogan's Turkey was propagated as some sort of a model. It was a unique case where these newly democratized or possibly democratizing countries in the Arab world could emulate. And um, his popularity, as you can see from this picture, was on the streets of uh, Cairo, where Erdogan actually went and addressed uh, the Arab Spring crowd. But yeah, only four or five years after that, Turkey, had, Turkey experienced a coup attempt in 2016. And this was, this was shocking because everybody thought that the military was now back in the barracks and Turkey moved on from its uh, coup-inflicted uh, past, and there was this new Turkey. But now military was back on the streets again with tanks and troops and uh, fighter jets uh, bombing the parliament. Turkish economy was 
in crisis. Now, today, Turkey is, is going through an economic recession. Um, about 10 years ago, Turkey was, uh, was an economic miracle uh, also. Turkey doesn't have the, the kind of confidence that it used to have in dealing with other states, with neighbors, um, because the confidence then brings you uh, flexibility in, in dealing with uh, the conflicts both within the country and abroad. This is not the case anymore. The Turkish state is basically pumping out a very defensive nationalist uh, discourse through the mainstream media, and it's a, it, is, it has the image of a country that is on alert. Everybody else is out there to get Turkey, and Turkey has to defend itself. So that's the main uh, uh, mode in which the Turkish state is run, or, uh, or the, the main uh, vibe that Erdogan gives in his speeches to uh, his uh, social constituency. And finally, Erdogan does not enjoy the kind of reputation that he used to enjoy um, in 2010, especially in the West. Uh, basically, his political credibility is uh, more or less over. And that is, uh, that is quite dramatic. So basically, within a decade, Turkey went from being a regional powerhouse, a confident state with incredible economic growth, uh, Erdogan having a reputation east-west, this new Ottoman Turkey, basically... Um, going down in a matter of few years and having a coup threat, uh, being on alert, not, now not being able to rely on soft power but hard power as we can see from the Syrian incursion, um, and Erdogan has lost all the credibility. How do we explain this? I think this is, uh, this is a, one of the biggest puzzles that, uh, that hasn't really been explained. Um, how do we account for the rise of neo Ottoman Turkey in the first place? And how do we then account of, 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 the, of the fall of it? I said in the beginning that, that Erdogan sits at the center of all this drama, but I suggest that we shift the focus from Erdogan to a network of entrepreneurs that became the original social base of Erdogan. They're referred to as Anatolian Tigers. So I will focus on two ideologically distinct networks that grew out of these, this social milieu of Anatolian Tigers and basically argue that, that it is Erdogan's relationship to these networks that holds the key to understanding much of what I have described uh, now. So the rest of the lecture, basically, I will explain to you uh, who the Anatolian Tigers are and the two networks that, that I just uh, mentioned. So the story starts uh, sometime in the 1980s. 1980s were, um, was the decade when uh, Turkey transitioned from an import substitute economy into an export-oriented open economy. So Turkish economy was liberalized in the 1980s. And for those of you who are not familiar with what import substitute economy is, it is basically in countries where you don't have industrialists and businessmen who have the experience and the capital to compete with the rest of the world. States then take protective measures, uh, increase the tariffs or ban uh, the import of certain products, and at the same time subsidize um, their own maybe select group of industrialists and businessmen at home and give them a ready-made uh, consumer market. That is, that, is the, um, that is the whole nation. And in the 1980s, what happened was that with the liberalization of uh, Turkish economy, it, there a new space opened up for entrepreneurs um, who are running small to medium enterprises in the, in the um, provincial centers of Turkey outside of Istanbul to then take advantage and establish their own independent links with the international market. So now they could import 
uh, relatively uh, cheap um, materials and machinery and with which they could produce and manufacture goods which then they can sell both to the national market but also uh, to the global market. So they were developing these business connections with the rest of the world without relying on the Turkish state. So they were independent uh, entrepreneurs emerging in the political uh, periphery of Turkey. And they were very different from the earlier generation of industrialists and manufacturers and so on, in the sense that the earlier generation, because they relied on the Turkish state so much that they also had to align their ideology, their outlook with the official ideology of the state. So the earlier generation of businessmen industrialists were very secular in outlook. Uh, but these uh, new entrepreneurs were openly Muslim. They happened to share a, a, a religious uh, conservative outlook and they didn't refrain from expressing uh, their piety publicly because they didn't really need the state. They, were, they didn't rely on state, so they didn't have to align themselves with the state ideology. And, and they didn't find any representation initially in the country's major chambers of commerce and chamber of, chamber of uh, industrialists and artisans and associations like that. What they did instead was to form their own associations, alternative voluntary associations. And, and one of the most important, perhaps the biggest one, oh, sorry, it cut into the text there. It's uh, MUSIAD which is uh, the abbreviation for Independent Industrialists and Businessmen Association. Now, Musiad's main aim was to increase the capacity of these small entrepreneurs in you know, maybe sh allowing them to share information among each other, uh, giving them access to certain resources so that they can be more competitive in the international market. But they, they also had the aim of bringing together these entrepreneurs to have a you know, have a say in the cultural and political conversations going on in the country. After all, they were now having a new wealth accumulated in their hands, then they wanted to, you know, have some say in, in the politics and the future of their country. So, Musiat, the M there, uh, stood for Mustakil in Turkish, an Arabic loan word, uh, which means independent. They were independent, as I said, from the Turkish state. But it was widely understood that it also stood for Musliman, Muslim, because they shared that, that religious outlook. So they, from the very beginning, one can say that they had, they, there was a fusion of this entrepreneurial economic ambition and a religious identity. So a very strong um, fusion. And actually the Musiyad, the, the members of, of, of this association, came up with a concept to express this, this fusion, this, this entanglement, which was Homo Islamicus. It was the title of an edited volume that they published in 1993, I think, maybe 1994. Um, it brought together, this edited volume brought together uh, some traditional uh, pieces of uh, uh, writing from the, the, the Islamic tradition, but also new articles to basically explore possibilities for an individual ethics and a corporate behavior that would be underpinned by, by, um, by moral values drawn from the Islamic traditions. So Homo Islamicus was obviously in reference to Homo Economicus of, of Western capitalism, and it was very much like Homo economicus in the sense that the individual would, uh, in, in his uh, dealings, would maximize utility, and if, if he's a producer, then it would maximize profit. But at the same time, that person would be obligated or that company would be obligated to give back. And the, and the, the mechanisms or the proportion of how much one gives back to the community or in what ways, using what social mechanisms, were to be drawn from the Islamic traditions and also from the, uh, these, uh, the, the cultural norms of the uh, Turkish conservatives in, uh, the, in the provincial towns of Turkey. <clears throat> so Homo Islamicus was, was an ideal type, if you like, uh, a person, a corporate uh, behavior that would, 
that would drive the charity uh, networks and religious foundations, or what, what are otherwise known as wakafs, to channel this new growing wealth in Muslim hands into acts of public uh, philanthropy and, and social solidarity. So they actually extended uh, this wealth into the urban poor, uh, the poor neighborhoods of Istanbul and, and, and many other major cities, Ankara, uh, Izmir, etc. So with these charity networks, the social uh, depth of the Anatolian Tigers extended immensely. It wasn't just these entrepreneurs, but there was a bigger audience that was forming around them, very receptive to the ideas that were developing in the intellectual circles among the Anatolian Tigers. So the idea of Homo Islamicus, or the fact that they would publish such uh, things or would be concerned about conceptualizing what they were doing has something to do with that conversation that they had to explain themselves to the rest of the society. And then they were announcing that they were coming up and they were ready to maybe take over some of the uh, functions, uh, be it economic, political, and otherwise, that were previously uh, in the hands of the secular elite. So this, this network is a very loose network that included um, religious foundations, schools, channel, sort of channels of social provision that included scholarships to the students, helping uh, credit uh, uh, for, for uh, women in the urban, poor urban neighborhoods of Istanbul, so on and so forth, became the basis of, of, of Erdogan's rise uh, as first as the mayor of Istanbul. Because what this network didn't have in the beginning was Istanbul. Istanbul was the commercial financial heart of uh, Turkey, and, they, and it was in the hands of the secular establishment. But they began to knock on the doors of Istanbul through this young, ambitious figure, Erdogan, who was a very young, promising figure of the Islamist movement at the time. So it was thanks to these sorts of networks being very active, an activist in the urban neighborhoods, that whatever Erdogan said, uh, or the moral arguments of cleaning up the city, getting rid of the corrupt politicians, or serving the people, all that had a social weight. Because people could actually see that the kinds of people that Erdogan represented were doing the job already on the ground. So they, there, there was a lot of trust already accumulating toward Erdogan before he became a mayor. And that's how he rose. And when he became the mayor, of course he had to give back to the Anatolian Tigers. And, and it came in the form of government contracts on you know, various urban projects. It also allowed these Anatolian Tigers, which by, what I keep saying Anatolian Tigers, by that I mean, you know, families of entrepreneurs now emerging, getting richer and richer by each year. So now the scene is crowded with uh, competing uh, Muslim entrepreneurs coming from various parts of uh, Turkey. So Erdogan gave these uh, medium-sized enterprises a chance to, through the government projects, for example, to um, partner with major companies from elsewhere or to get huge loans because the, then uh, they would have the benefit of you know, working with uh, Istanbul municipality. So there was that uh, very close relationship between the Anatolian, and, Anatolian Tigers and, and Erdogan as Erdogan became that switch uh, between the Anatolian Tigers and, and the global um, um, global capitalism. Erdogan developed very strong relations with particular families of these Anatolian Tigers, and, he, and those relationships went on. Basically, those companies and families uh, 
thrived in, in accordance with, uh, with Erdogan's career. So they got richer and richer as Erdogan rose uh, politically in Turkey. And they gave back by donating huge sums to the, a number of philanthropic and religious organizations and foundations associated with Erdogan and his family. So there was this back and forth of Erdogan opening up the ground for Anatolian Tigers, then, they, then them uh, investing or, or, or giving a lot of uh, uh, money back to the religious foundations by which Erdogan then can run an alternative, a parallel welfare state of sorts. Uh, remember that this is a period when the welfare state around the world also is on a retreat. So it's important to monopolize uh, these channels of social provision. So this is, uh, you know, one, this is one network. And this network was not limited to Turkey. They had... Uh, Charity organizations like the IHH, uh, which is an abbreviation for uh, Association for Human Rights and uh, Humanitarian Relief. And as you can see, their geography is certainly not limited to, to Turkey. They actually uh, was, they were found, the, the association was founded by people who were active in uh, bringing humanitarian relief to the Bosnians during the Bosnian War. And they had very, or they had organic connections to the Turkish diaspora in Germany, um, and with, and they actually played a huge role in bringing the accumulated money in the diaspora into the Anatolian Tigers within Turkey, and also extending that across the world, especially, particularly to the Muslim societies in Asia and Africa. So they had a very ideological. Uh, motive in bringing that, uh, that, that charity network outside of uh, Turkey. So just like the homo islamicus, who would not be uh, limited by the national politics or, or national boundaries, these guys were also not limited by, by Turkey alone. And so, so they, they were instrumental in giving Erdogan a Muslim, moral, humanitarian face, both in Turkey and in abroad. So when you know, Erdogan today uh, s you know, say something about Rohingyas uh, or on Israel-Palestine Israel, uh, issue or you know, Somalia, that how the international community has been silent on Somalia and so on, these, these discourses have incredible social weight among the Muslim populations elsewhere because they have been on the receiving ends of these, these charity networks. So Erdogan basically capitalized on these networks to build this humanitarian, moral Muslim face that speaks to the East, Muslim East. Now I want to shift the focus to the other network. And we need to go back to the 1980s again. Because when these Anatolian tigers were on the rise, it wasn't just the religious foundations and uh, certain associations by which the growing Muslim uh, wealth was channeled into acts of social solidarity, but there was also the concurrent rise of charismatic preachers. Charismatic preachers who would find new audiences among these uh, newly rich uh, Muslim um, families and entrepreneurs, and one of them was Fethullah Gülen. Fethullah Gülen had a, already a community um, not a very big one uh, in the 70s, but in the 80s, the, the ranks of, of his uh, followership expanded immensely. These were businessmen uh, from various parts of Anatolia who were ready to exchange their wealth for Gülen's blessings. Gülen is an incredibly uh, charismatic uh, preacher, so uh, he could mobilize this, this, this group of followers to then invest much of what they accumulated in the education sector in particular. Because the Gülenis, oh, sorry, I, yeah, this is the number of water wells that the IHH built around the world. The Gülenis, unlike the Islamists, 
were not interested in um, expressing their Muslim identity or piety publicly and having uh, confronting the Turkish state or the secular establishment, they have a different ideology which they captured with the concept of by the concept of golden generation. And the idea there is to raise a new generation of Muslim youth, highly educated, pious, uh, but but very very much um, in demand anywhere in the world for a variety of professions. So it is not the Islamic education, it is not their uh, piety, though they would be pious individuals at the end, but it is their, um, their knowledge and their competence uh, in, in the professional world that counted for, the, for, for Gulen. I mean, there, there's, I can go on and on, on and on about where this comes from and you know, where Gulen got this idea, etc. Maybe we can explore it later. But this was a different uh, ideological strand than, than what Islamists had. And Gulenists were a very powerful community in the 1980s because of the Anatolian Tigers, but the turning point came in 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed. Because with the demise of the Soviet Union, what we saw was that millions of nominal Muslims were thrown into the open in the formerly communist uh, countries in the Caucasus and Central Asia. So with the opening up of the Soviet Union and end of the Cold War, the Gulenists going into these, uh, going out of Turkey into the Caucasus and Central Asia, basically added a new dimension to this idea of golden generation, which was to bring these former uh, brothers and sisters into the fold of Islam, but also bring these former communists into the fold of global capitalism because Gulenists were pro-business. Uh, they have been raising a new generation of uh, Muslim youth who, are, who know how to deal with the world and who are clean shaven in suits and so on. They, they had a very good reputation in the West. And so they were perfect agents, if you like, to, for that mission of bringing the Central Asia and the Caucasus into the fold of uh, global capitalism and Islam at the same time. And this was closely watched by the United States administration because the US had just emerged victorious from the Cold War and was very invested in establishing some sort of presence in former enemy lines, especially considering that there is uh, Iran uh, next to the Caucasus and Central Asia with an Islamic uh, government that is invested in exporting its revolution, and uh, Russia that is soon probably coming back on the scene and trying to reclaim the former, uh, former Soviet territories. <clears throat> so Gulenists, as they opened schools and businesses across the Caucasus and Central Asia, their pro-business outlook was complemented by this new outlook, pro-West outlook as well. They were on a mission helping the West in the Caucasus and Central Asia. Um, soon after, they, ex they expanded their operations all around the world. By the end of the 1990s, one could uh, find them in places like Thailand, Colombia, South Africa, uh, Russia, practically everywhere. Um, and this, this, I mean, I will come to this in a second, this will become very important for Erdogan to then uh, es to establish very good relations with the West. But before that, Erdogan's relationship to the Gulenists started in the early 2000s when Erdogan was first elected prime minister of Turkey. Although he was the prime minister, this is 2003, he was certainly very vulnerable against the political establishment, against the secular elites, 
who held the upper echelons of bureaucracy, who held full control of the judiciary and the army and the police. So any time they could bring Erdogan down. So Erdogan needed new cadres, educated cadres, to populate the bureaucracy. But he, didn't, he couldn't find any of that in the, among the Islamists because Islamists were the merchant types. They didn't really invest in the education of uh, or, or raising a new generation. Islamists were practically useless for him in, in, in his fight against the, uh, the secular elites. So he turned to the Gulenists because they've been successfully raising this new generation. So he, they had the cadres that Erdogan could rely on. These were, they, after all, they were part of the Anatolian Tigers. They all came from the same social milieu. They had this shared interest. Yes, their ideology was a bit different, but so was Erdogan now, a little different. Now he had, he was, as the prime minister of Turkey, he had to explain himself to the rest of the world, saying that he's not an Islamist, he's not there to ch transform Turkey a la Iran, but democratize Turkey a la Germany as like the uh, conservative Democrats there. Um, so Erdogan's main discourse then was to uh, be a, to, to have a Muslim leadership that is opening up uh, Turkey uh, for the benefit of all, all Turks and Kurds as well. So Gülenis proved their worth very uh, quickly. So as Erdogan opened the doors of the state to the Gülenis, Gülenis then uh, uh, began to populate uh, the ranks of the bureaucracy. And then soon enough, they orchestrated uh, these famous Ergenekon trials, which turned out to be based on uh, fabricated evidence, uh, but after you know, years later. But at the time, it served to bring the military's um, guard down and tarnish its image, and so that slowly and slowly Erdogan could uh, push the military back to the barracks. So it was the Gülenis that helped Erdogan you know, uh, succeed in his promise of taking the military out of Turkish politics. They also came, or they also managed to uh, pass a lot of reforms, helping Erdogan, uh, you know, craft new laws and reforms, etc., that would look good to the liberals and Kurds and others within Turkey, but also this broader uh, liberal international audience as well. But it wasn't just in Turkey that the Gülenists were helping uh, Erdogan; also outside, internationally, because. All these schools and businesses that Gülenis established, they did that by, 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 having, by building very close ties to the state elites of the countries where they operated. So the idea was, don't confront with the political government uh, of the country that, they, you know, that you're going. The idea was to, no matter what the legal system is, no matter what, who, the, who is running the country, have good relationship with them so that it, they give you enough space and time to then build your own um, infrastructure there. And Erdogan capitalized on this infrastructure. Basically, uh, Turkey, starting from 2008 onward, established, opened several embassies uh, in the countries where Gülenis were very active. And then Turkish airlines then um, added these destinations to its uh, network of places that it flies to, making it the, um, the airline that is flying to more destinations than any other airline today. Um, and with these, I don't know why it doesn't show. With, with all these, Turkey was opening up new channels, economic channels as well, by which um, basically it was enriching, it was enriching the country um, through import-export channels that went beyond Europe, uh, which was the main <coughs> traditional uh, market for Turkey. So Turkey became rich, and Erdogan,
Erdogan, as I said, um, became the face face of this of this Turkish miracle, but it was but it was on the shoulders of these two networks. So then, what happened? What happened that Turkey went from this uh, miraculous uh, story to um, a country uh, that is on alert, that doesn't have any soft power, not enjoying the reputation that it once did. It was the uh, falling out between Erdogan and Fethullah Gülen that started the whole um, thing. And it started sometime around 2010, 2011, already at the peak of their collaboration. Um, they began to suspect each other in terms of who may be their long-term intentions and so on. So one thing led to another. I don't want to go into the details because we are already kind of out of time. Um, and Erdogan started to target the infrastructure Gülenists have within the country. These were the tuition schools and other schools. Uh, media organizations, etc. As Erdogan targeted these organizations, then the Gülenists raised the stakes, basically using their cadres in the judiciary and the police force to then uh, bring, bring uh, out these uh, uh, corruption uh, charges against Erdogan that happened in 2013, uh, basically focusing on the um, links Erdogan have uh, with Iran, uh, through this one uh, interesting figure called Reza Zarab, which is now at the center of another U.S.-Turkey uh, drama, by the way. Um, but Erdogan survived the scandal, uh, and he went on. And not only he brought down the Gülenists within the country, he pressured other governments to uh, close down the schools and the businesses that, that Gülenists had. And by doing so, he was basically, with his own, own hands, bringing down the whole edifice of neo-Ottomanism. So it was, again, Erdogan that was, uh, by trying to save uh, him, protect him against the Gülenists, was bringing down the whole um, uh, neo-Ottomanist project. And that is, uh, that is where I will stop. And uh, have your, if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer. Thank you.